we can form a four vector quantity we call the gauge field A mu. And we take some really simple derivatives, we, we cover our physical fields A e and B. Now it turns out if we use this gauge field, there is a, a certain degree of freedom that we can use. It's, so essentially what, what happens is that we pick a certain function alpha and we add uh, the, the gradient of alpha to our old gauge field and we make a new gauge field A prime. And then we repeat the above calculations using A prime. It turns out that the physical field stays exactly the same. And that property is called the gauge invariance. And um, this, this thing here is called the gauge transformation. And uh, of course, it uses the gauge field. And for this theory, it has to be gauge invariant. So uh, under this gauge transformation, it has to stay unchanged. Now, these gauge transformations that I just mentioned, they form a group. A group that has a name, it's called U1. And essentially, uh, what's a group is just a mathematical structure. We don't need to worry about <coughs> worry about it that much, uh, but we need to keep in mind that this group has a shape um, or topological structure, just to be pathetic. Um, for purpose of this talk, let's just think of U1 as a circle, and that would be perfectly good. Um, so we talk about U1 gauge and circle, now what? let's make a torus. So what is a torus? In two dimensions, we take a rectangle, and then let's glue the red sides together to form a cylinder. Then we glue the yellow sides together to form a donut-shaped thing that we call a two torus. Now, in four dimensions, the uh, you know the procedures are very much the same. We take instead of a rectangle, we take a hypercube, and then we glue the opposite sides of the hypercube, and that forms a four torus. Um, and one can also think of four torus as four circles composed with each other, because in four dimensions. And we have four directions, so for each direction we have a circle, and um, that kind of makes sense. Um, <laughs> but by doing this, by replacing our Minkowski space-time with a four torus, our gauge is no longer in there. And that's a huge, huge problem. Um, so what's happening here is that there are something called a large gauge transformation. Essentially, these transformations correspond to the mapping such that if I go one loop, in my space. So you remember um, we have four torus. We pick one circle in that four torus. I go one loop in, uh, in that circle, and I will gain n loops in my U1 circle, which is the gauge. Um, so suppose I pick a large gauge transformation that goes zero loop around uh, the gauge, which is identity, and another gauge transformation that goes one loop around the gauge. There's an absolutely no way we can deform this guy into this guy because we have a hole in the circle. Uh, so uh, the consequences of this, the vacuum becomes uh, infinitely degenerate. So I will make an analogy for this guy in quantum mechanics. So before uh, we do anything to our space time, our system looked roughly uh, kind of like this. So I have a happy potential well, a quadratic sort of like simple harmonic oscillator. We know it very well. We can define a quantum system on it. We have a unique one state, but now we have uh, after we deform the topology, we have multiple wells. In fact, we have infinite number of wells, and we can label each well with an integer. And for each well, we can, of course, derive our quantum system again, but now if we still treat our n or zero state as our ground state, our theory is not going to work out. So to construct the correct theory, we need to sum over all these n states to create a true vacuum state for our theory, and this is called the theta vacuum state. And now this theta state is indeed the eigenstate of the large gauge transformation that I've mentioned that messes things up. And now it is a true vacuum. Now, this uh, new vacuum, it changes the vacuum energy because um, now we have multiple uh, wells. There will be tunneling between wells. So there will be tunneling between different vacuum states. Uh, so essentially, because of this tunneling, we have extra uh, contribution to the Casimir effect so the first part was like the uh, original conventional Casimir effect that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. The second part is a pure topological contribution that no one has ever discussed before, and that comes purely from the topology. Now we can see, although this is big and scary, all we need to take away from this is that it depends on tau, which is sensitive to the box size, sensitive to the dimension of the box, and depends on an unknown parameter called theta. So essentially, because of the sensitivity to the box size, it will create a physical pressure on the box by vacuum. 
uh, and this is, of course, measured. So in conclusion, there is an extra vacuum energy from topology, and this vac extra vacuum energy from topology corresponds to tunneling between the different vacuum states, and uh, it will ultimately create a physical force that's measurable in our system. So for future work, of course, we want to make uh, experimental predictions in, con in uh, condensed matter systems, to test our hypothesis and theory, and also would like to explore the consequences in cosmology, uh, because uh, there are theories that uh, trying to explain dark energy using vacuum energy. We want to understand how does this topological Casimir energy actually contribute to dark energy. And that's all. Thank you very much. One thing is that we looked into liquid crystals where there are systems which correspond to U1 Yes, yes. So that's something from um, Yes, there are actually a lot of parallels in the condensed matter system, and that's in fact why we want to construct our experiment in condensed matter system. Uh, in fact, in topological insulators, um, this, this theta is exactly equal to pi, and we have a similar effect. In and uh, second one. Um, so you mentioned that, like the torus that you were talking about is formed out of R four, like mm -hmm. that four torus. Does anything change if you go to the corresponding torus formed out of Minkowski space? Um, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure what you mean by if I take a because the Minkowski space it has a negative one metric, so essentially one of them has a negative sign. But I one part I did not mention because there's no, isn't enough time is that when I take this torus. Is that I have to compact, I have to wick rotate my time into the, 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 the complex region to compactify my time. Okay. Uh, so, I essentially, if we do that in the Minkowski space, um, my path into row will, will blow up. It will not make any sense. So, uh, I'm not entirely sure what will happen because the integral is not defined. And I, had, I had another quick question on kind of Aiden, which was. Uh, you mentioned that you want to see how this applies to the universe. Do you just mean in terms of based on what the topology of the entire universe is? Yeah, this happened, that I'm talking about the global topology okay. of the universe, not the observable local geometry. Right. So then presumably, with like in an open universe, you have no topological contribution. Would that be correct? In the open, when we talk about as far as I uh, understood it, uh, say from the W map, they say the the universe is flat. Uh, they're talking about local geometry. They're not talking about the global topology of the universe. Um, so they are not exactly the same thing. So we can still have a flat local universe, but still have a globally compact universe. Right, yeah, what I really meant was compact. Sorry. So is it right that if it's not compact? Uh, yeah, that's right. If it's not compact, then it does affect the Thank you. Oh. Any last questions? We've got another minute. So, so this four torus is just a starting point for more comp complicated and abstract topologies? Yeah, I mean, going to. yes. Uh, in fact, this is a particular example. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can. Uh, classify a topological spaces using homotopy groups, then you can pick any topolo uh, topology that satisfies a certain homotopy, then you will have this kind of. haven't considered that uh, specific topology. So right now we're sticking with really simple um, examples to make sure that there is actually something going on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Charles.